Okay, let's uh, review a couple of items just to make sure that uh, we say things the right way. When we, when I talked about the 90% transfer of energy between trophic levels in an energy period pyramid, I mentioned that 90% was lost, 10% is, turns into the flesh or work for the other animal that's above, that, or this is the feeder as opposed to the food. Uh, that's not exactly correct. Some of it is lost, and it's quite a bit of it can be lost to decomposition, uh, which means that's what goes into your sewer or your septic tank. This is what goes through your body undigested or partially digested. So only 10% is converted because of the total inefficiency of the system. Uh, some of it is lost as body heat, and some of it is lost as waste. Simple as that. So, then if we go back to um, the other, I'm sorry, the other lab, I'm going to talk about enzyme function again. This little TV screen. Enzymes enable molecules called substrates to undergo a chemical change to form new substances called products. Each enzyme acts on a specific molecule or set of molecules called substrates. Each substrate fits into an area of the enzyme called the active site. This fitting together is often compared to a lock and key mechanism. However, the enzyme changes shape a little to fit with the substrate. In the enzyme substrate complex, the enzyme holds the substrate or substrates in a position where a reaction can occur easily. After reaction, the enzyme releases the products and can go on to carry out the same reaction again and again. Okay, so the important aspect of that, let's just look at that picture again. Enzymes. We'll stop it right there. When we learn about protein synthesis, DNA, RNA, ribosomes and what happens, and how enzymes are actually synthesized, we find that when they peel off their, their, their sequence of amino acids and they start to fold. And they fold in a specific way and take on a specific shape. It's that shape that allows this enzyme to be functional. In the world of enzymes, structure is function. So, as I was mentioning in the last video, when your body detects foreign invaders like bacteria, your temperature goes up because the hypothalamus detects foreign bodies in your blood and wants to get rid of them. The strategy that's used is to denature the proteins of the invaders by raising your body temperature. And if the proteins of the invaders change structure enough, the invaders will die because their enzymes won't work. At the same time, your enzymes are not working as well and you feel sick until the fever breaks and then all of a sudden you feel very good again. So what really happens to you? Well, same thing. It's just that the hypothalamus is raising this body temperature by telling your cells to dump ATP into ADP and PO4. Your body temperature goes up rapidly and your enzymes do start to denature. If your body temperature gets too high, you'll die. But evolutionarily, the way this system has evolved is that your body temperature generally will not go high enough to kill you, but will go high enough to damage the invaders enough to give your white cells and your immune system a competitive advantage and they can wipe them out in a period of a day or two or a week or whatever depending upon the disease and then your fever will break and you'll be alright so that's what that's what's actually happening there the other thing we want to look at is we're going to start to talk about photosynthesis and remember the photosynthesis starts down here at the producers, not the decomposers. They're not plants. It's the green plants 
that capture energy from the sun and build organic molecules to store that energy. We call it glucose or sugar primarily, but that's not the only pathway. Okay, so I have a short video that we want to talk about a little bit. It's a pretty good one. And uh, we want to talk about chloroplasts as she, the narrator, discusses them. Green bodies called chloroplasts within their cell. Start it over. The green color of algae and of cabbages, pine trees and grasses all comes from small green bodies called chloroplasts within their cell. Chloroplasts are distant descendants of once free-living green bacteria. They still have their own DNA, and they still reproduce by asexual division. Bill okay, I stopped it here for a minute so I can comment on it. First of all, there's a photosynthesis wrap that talks about the thylakoid membranes. This is uh, the diagram of what thylakoid membranes look like. This is where there's electron transport and uh, uh, to to capture uh, on by raising the levels of electron orbits uh, in their orbits, uh, you know, from the sun's light that's captured. She said that chloroplasts were once free living bacteria. She's going to say it again. Our textbooks say that chloroplasts and mitochondria both might have been free-living bacteria that developed through evolution commensal relationships or symbiotic relationships with other living cells so that these are she calls them actual bacteria uh, so I wanted you to be aware of that because chloroplasts have their own DNA and so do mitochondria in animal cells. Um, but there are also mitochondria in plant cells. In animal cells, mitochondria have DNA that, for the most part, only comes from our mothers. And we'll talk more about that in future, future units. But because it only comes from our mothers, um, people are using mitochondrial DNA to trace our lineage back all the way to Eve in theory. But to reiterate, uh, mitochondria and chloroplasts are thought to be possibly the result of evolution of free living organisms that develop symbiotic relationships with other living cells and became a part of the cellular organelle system in those cells up to a substantial population within each plant cell. As far as a chloroplast is concerned, it is a member of a reproducing population of green bacteria. The world in which it lives and we... See, there she goes again. She says it's a member of a living population of green bacteria. I think that's not a real accurate statement. And the reason is because those bacteria cannot live on their own. Those chloroplasts cannot live on their own for very long. They need the cell and their reproduction matches cell division so that once that cell divides then they will divide and increase their numbers, the chloroplasts that will, up to a, uh, up to a certain amount. And uh, they are not dividing to the point where they kill the cell or blow the cell up or whatever. So I think it's a stretch to call them free living, a population of free living bacteria, but it does follow this theory that they may have evolved from that at one point in time. Produces is the interior of a plant cell. From time to time its world suffers a minor upheaval when the plant cell divides into two daughter cells. Roughly half the chloroplasts find themselves in each daughter cell, and they soon resume their normal existence of reproducing to populate their new world with chloroplasts. All the while, the chloroplasts use their green pigment to trap photons from the sun 
and channel the sun's energy in the useful direction of synthesizing organic compounds from carbon dioxide and water supplied by the host plant. The oxygen waste the oxygen waste is used by the plant cells in respiration and the excess is exhaled through the stoma down here, the pores in the plant leaves, and that's where our atmosphere gets its oxygen. You'll notice she made a statement a moment ago that I simply don't agree with. Do you know what that statement was? Let's back her up just a minute. A partly used by the plant and partly exhaled into the atmosphere. Oxygen wastes are partly used by the plant and partly exhaled into the atmosphere through holes in the... I've got to back it up a little more. ...and channel the sun's energy in the useful direction of synthesizing organic compounds from carbon dioxide and water supplied by the host plant. The oxygen wastes are partly used by the plant and partly exhaled into the atmosphere through holes in the leaves, called stomata, singular stoma. Yep. Okay, I didn't get it backed up far enough, but what I was going for was that she said that the uh, chloroplasts capture photons from the sun. Uh, they do not capture photons from the sun. Where are the photons? They're gone. They're reflected back. What they do is the photons from the sun are absorbed and some of the energy is used to uh, move electrons to higher states within these uh, different molecules in the thylakoid membrane. So that was an oversimplification of, of the truth because if, if, if they captured photons, then it makes it sound like they could shine back at you, and they don't shine back at you. Uh, so we'll listen to just a little bit more of this. Organic compounds synthesized by the chloroplasts are ultimately made available to the host plant cell. Interestingly reminiscent of the Mixatrix tale, some chloroplasts show evidence of having entered plant cells indirectly by piggybacking inside other eukaryotic cells which would presumably have been called algae. The evidence is that some chloroplasts have a double membrane. Presumably the inner one is the wall of the original bacterium, the outer one the wall of the alga. As with Mixotrica, we can see recent reenactments in the many examples of single-celled green algae being incorporated in the cells or tissues of fungi and animals, for example the green algae that inhabit corals. Those chloroplasts that have a single membrane presumably enter directly, not on the coattails of algae. All the free oxygen in the atmosphere comes from green bacteria, whether free living or in the form of chloroplasts. When it first appeared in the atmosphere, oxygen was a poison. Okay, let's stop her right there again. <laughs> we know that the trees outside of my window are giving off oxygen as a byproduct of photosynthesis because some of the oxygen is needed for the plant's own respiration and some is excess and it's given off. She just said that uh, all of the oxygen in the atmosphere was created by these blue-green algae or whatever. Uh, not true. <laughs> it's not true. So um, the origin of the oxygen in our, in our air may have started there, but it's not true. So when you watch these videos, even though uh, I think this is a pretty good one, you have to be very careful about knowing the material so that you can spot mistakes or uh, unintentional uh, language that le could lead to misconceptions. Uh, but the important point here is that photosynthesis is where it all starts that's where our energy is captured. So when you get to the questions that want you to divide one trophic level by the other in order to determine um, the efficiency of transfer from here to here to here to here, when you get down to the producers, 
there's nothing to divide by because it came from the sun.